From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is off this week. Most of you are watching this program on New Year's Eve, which we thought was a good time to take stock of the year coming to a close and look ahead to the new year that is dawning. And to help me do that, I'm going to be joined today for a reporter's roundtable by Antonia Nuri Farzan of the Providence Journal, Ian Donis of the Public's Radio, and our own Eli Sherman. Thank you all for being here with me this morning. Happy almost new year. Uh, happy end of 2023. Um, so I want to go around the table first and uh, hear from everybody what you thought the biggest story of 2023 was. But first, I, I just have to ask, does everyone agree? It, are we all going to agree? Was it CD1? I think it was yes. CD1. Yeah. I disagree, Ted. All right. I, think I also disagree. All right. We two disagreements. <laughs> all right. You start, Ian. Why, well, what declining you trust in government has been a big issue at the national level. It's also resonating in Rhode Island. One of the big stories was the disastrous Philadelphia trip by David Patton and Jim Thorson, two state employees at the time who were accused of behaving badly. The year closed with the Washington Bridge mess. And if a narrative emerges that contradicts the McKee administration's approach, that could really erode uh, how people view the administration. And even if not, people think, well, road work started seven years ago or so under Gina Raimondo. Why are we having this big bridge problem? And public schools remain a big unfinished project. So I think confidence in government is a big hey, issue. You've been on this beat a long time, though, Ian. Is that a new thing, though? Rhode Islanders weren't exactly known for their deep Iowa-like trust in government, as far as I remember. You're right, Ted, but I think it kind of reinforces the cynicism of, of many people. Not getting out from it. All right, so you also don't think it was the first, Sister Grace. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, I also had the Philly trip. I just think that uh, looking back at a year's worth of stories, that story really was sort of a slow burn because initially mm -hmm. we discovered that there was some email that or letter that detailed all of this bad behavior. Initially, the governor wouldn't release it, um, so... We filed APRA complaints as to the projo, and, and and then it led to the attorney general ruling that it must come out. So there was this slow burn. It was just a slow moving story for so long, and then it came out, and the and the letter itself was just so damning. It of course launched a state police investigation, two ethics probes, and then there was a third um, on McKee, who had had this controversial lunch with the developer Scout. And then ultimately, it led to the canceling of the contract to, with Scout, which then left the armory in, in Cranston, uh, in, sorry, the Cranston Armory in Providence <laughs> in a lurch. And really, there's no clear path forward yet on what's going to happen with that building. So a slow, slow lead up to a big story that then had a lot of fallout. And now, um, you know, a big old question mark. Well, and I do admit, <clears throat> uh, pardon the cough, folks, I'm uh, getting over something here. But you, you do, when you get to these year-end shows, realize how you forget what was a big deal six, eight months ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I do remember with the Philly trip, you forget it was in the New York Times, and the, mm -hmm. they had a field day with it in Philadelphia, as we all recall. But, uh, Antonio, you and I both did agree that perhaps the obvious choice, the first congressional district race, a totally unexpected one, was uh, the number one local story of the year. Why do you think so? I think a bunch of reasons. I mean, first, you know, first black congressman, first person of color to represent Rhode Island, that on its own is significant. Also, it's easy to forget because the general election was a little anticlimactic, but the primary victory was very <laughs> surprising. I mean, we're talking about someone who this time last year, outside the political media class, no one knew the name Gabe Amo. And also, David Cicilline resigning was a total shock when that happened to lead the Rhode Island Foundation. I mean, no one thought we even were going to have an election this year. Yeah, I remember that morning. That was, I think it was even more surprising than Langevin, because there have mm -hmm. been rumors about Langevin for a while. I think you'd agree, Ian, but yeah. Cicilline, we didn't think so. Now, you're seeing on, on screen now, you saw them briefly, uh, Seth Magaziner and Gabe Amo, who are both freshman congressmen, are both going to be up for their first re-election races in 2024. And Ian... Even though they're both brand new, there's not much sign they're going to have much opposition. Yeah, I think it would be surprising if they had competitive races. Uh, certainly if Aaron Regenberg had emerged as the victor in CD1, I think that would have invited a lot more competition in 2024. But Seth Magaziner seems very secure. The Republican Congressional Committee in, in D.C. likes taking pot shots at him. But uh, whether there's a viable GOP candidate to take on either of these is really highly uncertain. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing for me is I, uh, when I was thinking about why I thought that was the big story, along with how much it dominated a lot of our time, 
Um, you've had a real generational change mm. in the local delegation. And you, I look across the border. We've talked about this on the show before, but you now have a millennial. Three out of the four local house seats are represented by millennials for the first time. And of course, as you said, Gabe Amo, the first person of color uh, to represent Rhode Island in Congress. So an, an interesting time on all that. Uh, I do think that there were a couple of stories within that race, too, that were mm. massive. Mm -hmm. We had the um, Sabina Matos True, yeah, signature it's, it's scandal. Bigger than just right. the then Don Carlson, uh, also a Democratic candidate, who stepped down among some controversy of his past, past behavior. And <clears throat> it would be remiss not to mention that that really also helped Gabe Amo uh, on his path to victory, especially on the East Bay, which maybe Carlson could have pulled from at the time. Yeah, you Amos need to have a good campaign, but you also need good time. And go ahead again. Amo's victory, I think, was really noteworthy because there was a real question if he would get the name recognition in a couple of months necessary to win. And he scored a very decisive victory. If I recall, it was seven points over Regenberg in an 11 person field. That was really a decisive victory. And I'd say, and Tony, I don't know if you agree, he, he was underestimated, I'd say, for quite a Absolutely, bit of that yeah. race. Yeah. yeah. I remember people talking like, oh, there's no way. Absolutely right. not. No one's heard of this guy. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, all right. Well, let's look ahead now, uh, or before we look ahead, uh, back to back there in 2023, almost over. Um, there are always stories that fly under the radar, sometimes that some of us look at, that uh, we think about, that maybe should we think should have gotten more attention, but didn't. So I want to hear from each of you on that. And Tony, I'll start with you on this one. What did you think was a, a significant story in 2023 that um, maybe didn't rise level of the top story, but you mm -hmm. thought was important? Yeah. Well, I'm biased because it's something I've been covering, but I would say continued problems with nursing home staffing, not being able to stay in business. We saw Charles Gate close this year, you know, could be more coming down the road. And it seems like everyone from every perspective agrees the problem is Medicaid reimbursements. They don't get enough money, essentially, from the government, but just nothing is being done about that. And it's a huge part of the Medicaid budget, too, mm -hmm. at, the, at the state yeah. level. Ian, how about you? What do you think was a big story? Critics have been sounding an alarm for years about Prospect Medical Holdings, the California-based owner of Roger Williams Medical Center in Providence and Our Lady of Fatima Hospital in North Providence. This was the year when the chickens came home to roost. Both the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Health got involved because uh, Prospect was not paying its vendors for the two hospitals in a very large amount of money. And you really have to alienate vendors to attract regulatory action in that. That creates uncertainty about the future of the hospitals. There is a Georgia-based nonprofit that has made an application to buy the two hospitals, but the union, uh, the United Nurses and Allied Professionals, is very wary even of this proposed buyer. So that's a story that bears watching. And there's so much attention always on life-spanning care in New England, which are the biggest and are significantly bigger than the prospect hospitals, but that's the number three group, and there'd be huge dislocation if anything serious happened to those facilities. Yes, and uh, Roger Williams Medical Center and Fatima are huge employers and huge taxpayers in their respective communities. Yeah. In, uh, in Eli, how about you? 2023 uh, was a story under the radar. I'm beginning to notice a trend here because it's all healthcare, but <laughs> mm. mine is Medicaid re-enrollment, and don't fall asleep here. It's a very important <laughs> topic. But essentially, you know, more than a third of the state's population is covered by the taxpayer-funded health insurance coverage called Medicaid. And it was not, there was a re-enrollment process that was required every year. You didn't have to do that through the pandemic. They paused it. But they restarted it, and it has created quite a kerfuffle across the country because now so many people have to go through this process. I have to say I've been following it closely. Antonia and I covered it at the beginning. Um, it's been going okay. The big test is right now coming into the new year because uh, they had not been doing any re-enrollments for family and children. So now the biggest cohort is coming through this recertification process. And it'll, so, so it's definitely something worth watching. Right and now. I, I just want to reinforce what you just said, Medicaid. A th over a third of uh, people in Rhode Island are on Medicaid at some point in the year. I was looking at the report that they put out annually, and you know it's over $3 billion. A lot of that federally covered, but over a billion is state money. And the number of people on there, it's really, it's not, just the poor people program anymore. It's, it's just a huge part of the healthcare infrastructure in the state, which which I think is gonna be part of why it's gonna be such a big issue in the in the budget debate next year, which mm -hmm. I expect to be big. All right, now let's look ahead. 2024, hard to believe we're already talking about 2024. Uh, what's a big story and you expect to be watching in 24? Well, speaking of the budget, Rhode Island lawmakers have kind of been living in fantasy land for a few years with consecutive budget surpluses. I mean, if you told you or me, Ted, five years ago that was gonna happen, I think we would have been highly skeptical because 
because we have to reach back to the Lincoln Ahmed administration about 20, 25 years for the most recent previous surplus. But now the federal largesse from the COVID era is at a close. Speaker Shikarchi is pouring cold water on the uh, spending proposal, outstripping available cash. So how that plays out is going to be a big story to watch this year. And we saw Antonio did a, uh, Shikarchi told the War Beacon in an interview. He said he's yeah. got seven hundred million dollars in unfunded requests. I mean, I think they're they're going to have they're going to say no to a lot of people right. next year. The gravy train is over. I think was his quote <laughs> yeah. in that story as he was eating sausages and gravy. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, he was eating yeah. gravy already. He was at a diner. I, are you expecting, I mean, do you think it's going to be hard or do you think it's a little overblown, uh, Yeah, Eli? The budget? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that this is going to be tremendously difficult. And you think about all of the things that <laughs> are on the table. People, they didn't get money the last year. They didn't get money the year before. They're still asking for money. But now all those other people who did get the money, they're also asking for money. There's just too many too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a real change. Like you said, Ian, it's it's not a situation we would have expected. This was perennially how budgets were for mm. a while, and now now we're going to really feel it again. All right, Antonia, you looking ahead to next year. What's something you expect to be spending some time on in 24? I'm going to say housing. Um, so we saw Speaker Shikarchi passed a package, fairly uncontroversial, um, the bills, it seemed, that passed this past session. And now, kind of at the 11th hour before these laws actually go into effect, we're now seeing towns say, hey, wait a minute. We don't actually want to do this. Um, so I'm curious. Because we should say most of them take effect January 1st. Correct. Yes, they take effect January 1st. And I'm curious to see, are we going to see lawsuits challenging these? Are we going to see towns just not complying? Is anyone going to enforce these? And also, I'm curious, you know, all of these changes are essentially zoning changes, changes to make it easier to build. So that there's a while you have to wait for that trickle down effect to happen before that actually turns into new construction. So what happens in the meantime? I mean, we saw there was that Zillow study that came out with with Providence having the highest rent increase, highest increase in rent prices in the country over the past year. So is there going to be any kind of immediate relief? Does Providence pass rent control, for instance? Yeah, and Eli, I, there was I have to credit to the Boston Globe because obviously this is a regional mm -hmm. problem. Just did a whole spotlight mm -hmm. series, their investigative unit on the high cost of housing in, in Greater Boston. They, they, it's, I, I recommend people check it out because they had a lot of good information and details that got in the weeds. And there's so many layers to it. The, the final piece was about the construction costs, yeah. which are going up and up and up and up. And of <clears> course, uh, one person wrote back to me on, on X on Twitter and said, uh, and the problem in Rhode Island is you have the Boston costs with high but lower right. rents and mm -hmm. the, the, it doesn't pencil out. So uh, it's still unclear, despite all this activity, I think, Eli, whether they're going to be able to really move the needle. Yeah, I mean, the construction cost is a real thing. Even before we saw this ramp up in inflation and, and construction costs go through the ceiling, there was development here that needed to be subsidized because developers were saying, look, we can build here, but your rents are so low that we're not going to make back our money. So we're going to look in Boston instead. Well, now construction costs are even astronomically higher than they were. And we see rents also coming up. But if you're a developer thinking about building housings, housing, you have to do that calculation. And oftentimes it's either, OK, I either have to get some sort of subsidy from the government to make this work, or I have to raise rents to <laughs> to places that people can't afford. And yeah. Ian, uh, one last thought before we go to a break. Uh, you, I think, shared at some point when we were debating this over the course of the year, a Providence Phoenix story you did on housing and the struggle to have enough affordable housing in Rhode Island. The Phoenix, RIP the Phoenix, God <laughs> bless it. But th you know that was a good 15, 20 years ago, probably. Yeah. I mean, w why hasn't it changed? Well, that you're right, Ted. That story was from 20 years ago. <laughs> and at the time, the director of Rhode Island Housing, Richard Godfrey, talked about how his children couldn't afford a home in Rhode Island. So imagine how much worse things are now, particularly when Rhode Island has traditionally been a less expensive alternative to Boston. But I think it's a it's a complex problem. Housing starts have been very low in Rhode Island for a number of years. Zoning is a big factor. As we all said, there, we're starting to see some pushback to some of the proposed zoning changes, construction costs. There are just a lot of moving parts to this problem. And even Shikar uh, Speaker Shikarchi acknowledged last year that it's going to take many years to make progress on this due to the complexity of the issue. Yeah, one of the developers, the Globe interviewed, said, it's so expensive up here, my son had to move to Rhode Island. And so. that's exactly the problem. That's why <laughs> right. they're pricing us all out. Right, exactly. Yeah. People with Newton salaries coming yeah. down uh, and buying these And I think also the rise of remote work now, I mean, it's 
always been an issue, like we reported back then, Ian, but now people who work in Boston don't necessarily have to go to Boston every day of the week, so it suddenly looks a lot better to and even new Pawtucket train station. That's a great point. We even see New Yorkers who yeah. can buy, you know, like the coastal lanes a lot cheaper here than mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Westerly. Can, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a great point, Antonia. All right, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to look ahead to the 2024 election cycle, both locally and nationally, which promises to be a barn burner. Stick with us for this New Year's Reporters Roundtable on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers on this New Year's weekend. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is off this week, and I'm joined for a reporter roundtable looking back at 2023 and ahead to 2024 by Ian Donis of the Public's Radio, Antonia Nouri Fazan of the Providence Journal, and our own Eli Sherman here of WPRI 12. And I said we want to talk about elections. It's going to be a big election year all over the place, 2024. Um, Ian, I'm curious. You know, you, our job generally is to watch more of the local and state elections. So, what what's top of mind to you as you look? into 2024, you know, what races do you think we'll all be covering closely? Two things. Uh, it's a year for legislative elections, and we saw how back in 2020, the Rhode Island Political Cooperative made some dramatic gains. The establishment kind of struck back in 2022 and really blunted the co-op, although progressives have still picked up seats in the General Assembly. I think the more recent trend will continue. And the Cranston Merrill race mm -hmm. is a big one to watch with um, the incumbent Ken Hopkins announcing for re-election. A lot of eyes on State Rep Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, the wife of former Cranston Mayor Alan Fung, who's very expected to run for mayor of Cranston. And you don't often have a hard-fought GOP primary in Rhode Island, but that could be a, a very lively race. Yeah, and I'm not sure how that one's going to go. The Fungs, of course, we know are very strong in Cranston, but Hopkins is an incumbent, and that's, I think that's going to be interesting. It's, Antonio, you've looked a bit, to going back to what Ian said about legislature, about the divides on the left mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, which I find very interesting. As Ian says, you know, heading into 2020-2021, it looked like the left wing in the Democratic Party was strengthening and strengthening, and then you saw, as you say, in the kind of strike back by the establishment 2022, CD won a race. They clearly had an opportunity there, but Aaron Regenberg took as many arrows sometimes, it seems like, yep. from progressives as he did from people on the other side. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's not been any kind of left unity whatsoever. And I think we d we have seen, like you mentioned, there was a bit of incremental progress for the left, definitely shifting the General Assembly to the left. So I'm curious if that will continue, but that definitely is going to require people to come together and put together their beefs that they seem to be constantly levigating on Twitter. Yeah, they are. They are co there's constant <laughs> fights on Twitter. I can't always keep track of who's mad at who. Um, all right, so we talked about Krantz Mayor. That's certainly one on my Another mayor race, I think, is on your mind, right, Eli? Yeah, uh, the... The mayor race in Woonsocket, where not one um, we expected to be a big not, race. Not one because um, Lisa Baldelli Hunt, who's been the mayor there for about a decade, um, she stepped down just a couple of months ago, um, citing health reasons. But it also came in the wake of some reporting uh, that we had done and, and others about uh, a pretty controversial land deal that she had struck with a, a former friend, a business associate. Um, it was one point William one point one million dollars for a bunch of vacant land that she said she was going to build affordable housing for. That be became a big deal. They're, they've canceled that deal. She stepped down. Uh, Christopher Beauchamp uh, stepped in. He was the council president. And now, all of a sudden, 2024, when uh, Lisa Baldelli Hunt, up until this year, sort of seemed to lock. Um, she was even booted, as you guys remember, a year ago. Um, she was ousted by the city council and then wasn't even opposed running for re-election. So she really had a stronghold up there. She stepped down. Um, we saw just this week that state rep uh, Robert Phillips announced mm -hmm. that he's going to be running for mayor. I, I would presume that Beauchamp would probably try and keep the seat himself. And then Woonsocket politics can be a bloodbath. So well, I, and, I imagine a lot of drama. Uh, and we need to see what the other two one socket reps are, John <laughs> Brien and Stephen Casey, the latter who performed pretty well in the CD1 primary, whether they choose to get into the race or not. And Antonia, I love one thing I love, it's a little retro, but Radio yes. still matters oh, in one yeah. socket. Yeah, constantly. I think something gotta go on the radio all day long on WNRI. They're talking, fighting it out, people are calling <laughs> in. I mean, it's gonna be fascinating to see what happens. Yeah, there. In the, I think in smaller communities, I don't think the media ecosystem has changed quite as fast. Of course, we know Facebook groups and things have a big influence, but you know, I think of the radio stations in New Bedford, in mm -hmm. one socket, River, in yeah. Fall River, et cetera, the impact they can have the shopper in Burrowville, I yeah. think still matters. Bargain buyer. The bargain buyer, yeah. thank you, Ian. I know you've you have some Burrowville in your family. So you know, yeah. you know that it's area up good. Well, we have to mention too the the race uh, that'll be at the top of the ticket, aside from the presidential. We'll get to that, which is the United States Senate. Uh, 
Josh Sheldon Whitehouse is up again. He's running for re-election. This will be his uh, fourth term he'll be running for. He was elected in 06. We do have two Republicans running to, uh, for the nomination against him, Ray McKay, who uh, tried to run once before um, for Senate, and uh, Patty Morgan, who's in the legislature. But, you know, as we said before, I mean, history is what it is. We haven't seen a Republican win a major race around since 2006. Right. I mean, the last Republican to run against White House was Bob Flanders, a former Rhode Island Supreme Court justice, uh, someone who was able to raise some significant money, certainly an intellectual mm -hmm. uh, force. And, you know, he fell far short. I mean, that race was called in like two, <laughs> two minutes after the polls closed. So that just shows what an uphill fight it is for Republicans. And one thing, too, uh, what we were talking about before, Antonia, also no sign that there's going to be a major push from the left against Sheldon Whitehouse, even though there are always criticisms of him and Jack Reed for not being as left wing as Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey. But th they do sort of seem to avoid getting all the way into to having someone run against them. Right. Yeah. And part of having I mean, with the left is there really isn't a strong candidate at this point who would be able to be a credible challenger from the left who's emerged. So, you know, maybe down the line you see someone who's in the General Assembly now step up, maybe challenge Jack Reed from the left. Now, now, of course, we don't want to be myopic and just look locally. Uh, I, all of us are going to be watching, reporting on, and affected by the presidential race. Um, of course, Donald Trump's still looking very strong, um, even though, as of last night, he's get, been booted off the ballot, at least for now, in a second state in Maine. Um, this is really uncharted territory, Len. Yeah, and it's definitely uh, the thing to watch right now, I think, in the race. It, it seems pretty clear from polling that President Former President Donald Trump is the front runner on the Republican side. Joe Biden, of course, on the Democratic side. So we're looking at, at a, a matchup that we've seen before. But now in Colorado, they booted him, uh, Donald Trump, from, from the ballot, saying that because he was a part of an insurrection, he is not qualified for federal office. Uh, we're seeing the same thing happen in Maine. Now, we should note that um, a similar challenge happened here in Rhode Island. Uh, the courts tossed it out, and the Secretary of State, Greg Morey, says he will be on the ballot. He has no plans, at this point anyways, to remove Trump from the ballot in Rhode Island for the primary. But I think what we might see across the country is a cascading effect from Colorado and now Maine, and some other states may choose to follow suit, um, especially because now there's precedent that has come out of Colorado. And then that really draws questions as to, okay, what is this election going to look like, A, and B, what is it going to do to the electorate? Because Donald Trump has such strong support. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I doubt that his supporters are going to be, uh, feel too kindly to the fact that they don't have now the opportunity to vote for him in those states. Unless the Supreme Court overturns it. It's yeah. striking yeah. to me that even in Rhode Island, where Republicans are locked out of state and federal government, there is a disinclination by Republicans to criticize Trump. You really have to look to former Republicans like political operative Jeff Britt or former state senator Dawson Hodgson to find people who are outspokenly critical of Trump who are not lifelong Democrats. And that's very telling, and that shows why Trump... Uh, you know, is a viable candidate still. One exception I know is Steve Frias, the Republican National Committeeman, who I remember came out with a statement before any of the other Republicans on January 6th. Um, but let's go back uh, locally. And uh, Antonio, an interesting uh, ongoing uh, narrative, I guess, I don't know, um, in recent years has been about Dan McKee's relations mm -hmm. with the press corps. Um, we saw it again uh, when the bridge crisis happened and he exploded at Brian Crandall from Channel 10 for asking about Peter Alvidi's future. Now, as we all talk about, we, we're not asking him to feel sympathy for us. We can we can all take it, the slings and arrows mm -hmm. of unhappy politicians. But um, it does, in some ways, it can grind the gears of getting information yeah. if there's that much hostility from the electeds. Yeah, I think, I mean, what you see on TV is one thing, but what you don't see behind the scenes, what readers don't see necessarily, is how much all of us are fighting all the time. You know, this administration, their stance has seemed to be, if you make a public records request, we are going to fight you tooth and nail on that. We're not going to just hand this over. We're going to find reasons to deny it. And that ends up being a lot of time that we spend fighting and litigating these requests just to get basic answers, for instance, for something like the bridge problems. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, we're not getting from our health generally. We're trying, we think there's some public interest in the information. I mean, Ian, you, you've watched a lot of politicians. How much does it matter? I mean, Dan McKee has a roughly 50% approval rating. He won an easy re-election race. Heck, maybe running against the press can sometimes be pretty popular. That's true, Ted. <laughs> but at the same time, the public has a right to hear from their elected officials. And Governor McKee has been a lot less willing than his predecessors to come in for long-form interviews views on shows like this one or my weekly interview show at the Publix Radio, and that's a loss for the public.
And, and so a diametrically different approach to talking to uh, in public is Peter Narona, mm -hmm. the Attorney General, which I have found one of the most interesting people to watch his evolution. I mean, I remember as U.S. Attorney, he was seen as such a Boy Scout, didn't take any risks with his public statements. Now, I, by the time I wake up in the morning, he's sent tweets about baseball and cases and whatever else he's up to. And everything else. You know, do you think it's all political, Eli? Is the guy just, you know, sowing his wild oats and looking ahead? What do you think's going on? Yeah, I think politics is part of it. I think he's on the back end of his term so now he feels like okay I'm, do I'm now done with getting reelected to this office looking forward a what do I want to get done in the next couple years what do I really care about okay I'm gonna talk openly and freely about those things he picked his medium X which of course <laughs> has been something to rather amusing and scary to watch as, as uh, <laughs> reporters and members of the public over the years but um, yeah, I, then I do think it is politics. You know, he's looking at what the next big thing is, and, and he's accepted the conjecture that he's going to be running for governor. Um, and so maybe but he's, he's acknowledged he might run for governor. <laughs> exactly. And so he, uh, you know, he looks at this as his opportunity to maybe make some noise and really build up name recognition, which is already pretty pretty strong in the state. So just 10 seconds left, Eli. Is, uh, Ian, does he risk being seen as a loose cannon? Well, Judge Procassini uh, <laughs> might say yes to that, but it has elevated Nerona's profile, and it does create a strong contrast between Nerona and Governor McKay. Which will be interesting if they run against each other in 2026. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Eli Sherman, Antonio Nuri Fursan, and Ian Donis for joining me for this New Year's Roundtable. Happy New Year to all of you. Tim White will be back this week when our guest will be House Speaker Joe Shikarchi to talk about the legislative session ahead. See you next week.